Now you talk about terror. I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Hi, I'm Chris Hedges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. We're going to explore in this segment the political landscape, especially the uh, current presidential campaign, and what impediments are thrown up uh, by the two major parties, and in particular the Democratic Party, uh, that essentially keep the system hostage to corporate power. Uh, in the second segment, we're going to explore the solution. And to discuss these two issues with me is the Green presidential candidate, Dr. Jill Stein. Thank you, Jill. Great to be here, Chris. So let's begin with the nature of what some have called the dark state, um, how it operates, how it works. Uh, because every facet, uh, whether it's electoral politics, whether it's legislation, whether it's the courts, whether it's the mass media, has been completely seized by corporate power. And in many ways, uh, a chief executive like Obama uh, is beholden to those interests. There's very little influence on them. Um, how do you look at the American political system? It is uh, extremely corrupt. It serves the interests of oligarchy. It puts people, planet, and peace. Uh, it subjugates those critical things to profit. We have a political system which is funded and therefore accountable to uh, predatory banks and fossil fuel giants and war profiteers. And those are the interests it serves, those are the policies it creates, and it has, you know, it's, it's sort of like a, um, an amoeba that oozes its way into all aspects of the system. In the words of uh, Chief Justice Louis Brandeis a century ago, uh, you can either have a democracy or you can have vast concentrations of wealth. You can't have both. And we have a system, whether you call it um, corporate capitalism or corporatism or just plain greed, whatever you call it, we have a system that systematically puts profit over everything else. And it continues to um, spiral out of balance in a way that now puts us all in the target hairs. And I think that's the sort of exciting thing about this moment that we'll get to in, the, in, this, in part two, but it's reached a level where no one, except for really the 1% or perhaps the 5%, but no one now is, um, uh, is out of danger. We're imperiled in a very clear and direct way, whether you're talking about an entire generation of young people who are locked into debt for the foreseeable future, the decline of wages, the true joblessness that actually exists, the, uh, the foreign policy of total economic and military domination that's blowing back at us now catastrophically, uh, the immigrant uh, human rights disaster as 60 million people were forced to migrate over the past year alone. I mean, it's, and the climate is in meltdown. Right. So in, in some ways, we are in this kind of magical moment. It's, it's, it's an existential moment, which is very personal and very real. Uh, so it has enormous potential, I think, uh, for transformation. The question is, which way is it going to go? Right, but it's and not, how are we going to make that happen? And it's happen? that old uh, you know, essay by Rosa Luxemburg, Revolution or Reform. When you have all of the major institutions captured by uh, a tiny elite, power elite, uh, a cabal, whether that's an oligarchic cabal or fascist cabal, it doesn't matter. It essentially uh, shifts the focus of all of those institutions to serving that tiny elite at the expense of the citizenry. And that machinery is key, so that if you're running elections, in some ways it doesn't matter, uh, because these forces have captured uh, these uh, institutions and systems of control uh, and because they operate them, uh, they're beyond the capacity of a any particular politician to influence. Exactly. 
Uh, and that's what Sheldon Wolin calls inverted totalitarianism, by which he means it's not classic totalitarianism. It doesn't find its expression through a demagogue or a charismatic leader, but through the anonymity of the corporate state. Um, the arms industry, I mean, the whole expansion of NATO uh, is, is uh, largely to feed uh, the defense contractors. I mean, there's no rational reason why, and we had, of course, promised Gorbachev uh, with uh, the fall of the wall in Germany, uh, that NATO would not be expanded beyond Germany. Now we are pushing it right up to Russia's borders. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, a, a perfect example of how uh, rational security interests are sacrificed for profit. Um, you're a doctor. You, you, you understand uh, the disaster of our for-profit healthcare system, including, of course, Obamacare. Everything is commodified within the society. Yes, and, and I think your point is exactly right. Because it is so pervasive and so embedded into the DNA of our institutions, our non nonprofit corp, you know, industrial complex, our military, our political parties, that is the establishment political parties, um, unions uh, being co-opted to right. the degree that they are. Uh, the and large religious institutions for the most part, with exceptions. But the institutions we used to rely on at, as the basis of our society, you know, I learned from one of your books, you know, that how much they've all been corrupted. And it makes the point, We, in my view, elections need to serve the movement. Elections need to be about building long-term capacity. And I think political parties also need to serve the movement. They need to be firewalled against taking corporate money, against not only uh, super PACs, but PACs, you know, and accepting money from the surrogates. You know, ideally, we should have a completely publicly financed system. And in fact, in my home state in Massachusetts, we passed public financing for elections, and it was the Democratic legislature, 85% Democratic, which could have passed any law and overridden any veto by the Republican governor. It was they who dismantled the public financing that we had passed as the people uh, in a referendum. And it was at that point in uh, 2000, roughly 2000, roughly 2000, that I realized that change was not going to happen right. inside the Democratic Party. Well, let's talk about the Democratic Party. Well, how do, what, how do you, you view, view it as a political entity? What is, what is its role? <laughs> I, I don't think it's a rational, um, you know, uh, a product that has a specific intended role, but I think it, it's an expression of political power. And just look who funds it. You know, it's banks and hedge funds and, you know, and, and war profiteers and the private prison industry. This is who it is accountable to. And it works not only by controlling the money, it controls the media, uh, and particularly this, uh, this mockery of democracy that we call uh, presidential debates, right. controlled by the two political parties who decide not only, not only do they select the candidates through their, you know, basically their money, big money filter, but they also, they control the audience, you know, and they control what press gets in and they control the moderator and therefore the nature of the questions. So these are elaborate staged events right. to create the sense that resistance is futile. Uh, I had the great um, uh, pleasure of having fought my way into a statewide governor's debate in 2002, the first time I was tricked into running for office. Uh, against Mitt Romney for governor. You know, I was told, uh, you're a doctor, you're fighting community fights, just do that, call it a political campaign. And I, that's how I got tricked into doing it, discovered it was a different animal altogether. But it's also a very different animal from the way that corporate parties run campaigns. And I found it extremely uh, enlightening and very exciting uh, and a very empowering conversation that was waiting to happen. We fought our way into a debate because the public was going crazy even then in 2002 with this monologue, the Democratic-Republican monologue. We got into a debate and uh, I articulated the usual agenda of cutting the military, greening the economy, living wages, uh, a school system that actually teaches to the whole student for lifetime learning, not to attest, et cetera. Kind of the obvious things that went over like a lead balloon inside the TV studio. And when we walked out, I was mobbed by the press who told me I had won the debate on the instant online viewer poll. And at that point, you know, 
I realized that this is a scam. The whole right. political system is a scam. That we actually have power. In the words of Alice Walker, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. We do have power, but it's very hard to know it given how corrupt the institutions are. Well, they've are. created all sorts of mechanisms by which that power cannot be expressed. That's right. Uh, and actuated, actualized, and they've also created mechanisms by which dissident voices are really effectively shut out. If not thrown into the clinker, yes. If not thrown into the clinker. And, um, and so you, you end up with these kinds of uh, campaigns, the presidential campaign that we're currently watching, where in essence uh, you, are, you have two parties who um, are, are both beholden to corporate power. Uh, but stoke fear among uh, increasing, increasingly polarized segments of the population, fear mm -hmm. on the right with all of the homophobia and undocumented, against undocumented workers and this kind of stuff, and fear on, within the Democratic Party that uh, y you are going to unleash nativists and yahoos, and of course two of them would be Donald Trump and, and uh, Ted Cruz, on the country as a whole. I mean, what's interesting in the Republican Party is that, uh, you know, these kind of neocons, uh, Cheney, Wolfowitz, Pearl, you know, um, use these these culture wars to build a base, but they've kind of been overthrown. <laughs> um, and uh, how do you how how would you as frightening as a, as a Cruz or a Trump is? In power, how different do you think they would actually be from a Hillary Clinton? Well, you know, they are different uh, uh, around the margins of social policy, but in terms of war, the economy, exporting our jobs, attacking unions and workers, um, uh, privatizing our school system, our commons, uh, an energy system that basically puts fossil fuels and nuclear above all else, uh, turning our, our food system into, you know, a playground for uh, corporate industrial agriculture and GMOs and so on. You know, it's fundamentally the things that um, are destroying civilization and the prospects of life on the planet, you know, they're really shared between those two parties. And when people bring up the fear thing, you know, I think it's important to point out that the politics of fear has actually delivered everything we were afraid of. Right. All the reasons we were told that you needed to vote for Obama, uh, you know, or vote for Al Gore or whatever, you know, because you didn't want the expanding wars, you didn't want the meltdown of the climate, you didn't want the offshoring of our jobs, you didn't want the enormous bailouts of Wall Street, you know, 700 billion, 800 billion under Bush, but 16 trillion and counting under Obama. You know, the wars that know no end, that continue to massively expand. So, you know, I try to point out, I try to remind people that um, you have differences around the margins, but the core stuff is essentially the same. The differences are not enough to save your life, to save your job, or to save the planet. And we're not going to get out of this mess without some real work and some real sacrifice. It's not like there's a simple fix here. You really, we need a politics of courage, not a politics of fear. We have to understand how absolutely deadly the threat is that we are facing now, whether it's the next economic collapse, which we are really teetering on the brink right. of right now, or whether it is the meltdown of our climate, well, which... Well, we've got, we've raised by one degree, we've got another five degree in the pipeline, which we can't control, even if we stop all carbon emissions today. And, you know, we are looking at the collapse of our major ice sheets within the next couple of decades. Within a handful of decades, we could basically ruin all coastal cities. You know, when Pearl Harbor was bombed, uh, we called out a national emergency. And within six months, we had converted 25% of GDP to, um, you know, to a, a wartime footing and stayed there. You know? So the point is we can do what we need to about climate, and we'll talk about that more in the next segment. But we are facing an all-out climate emergency we, you know, and that's taking place. It got much worse under the Democrats. Obama with right. two houses that's of Congress. Right. People should not make excuses for Obama. It was the bad Republicans. And this is the second point about the politics of fear, which is that the lesser evil paves the way to the greater evil. It's not in opposition to it. 
it makes way for it well, because people don't come out to vote when you're just one shade well, less terrible we should than the bad guys. We should also acknowledge that Obama's assault on civil liberties have been worse than under Bush. That's right. uh, you know, on so uh, many fronts. The kill lists, uh, uh, the NDAA, uh, the, the, um, uh, the pursuit of, uh, of going of the after press. whistleblowers yes. uh, with the Espionage Act. So. Uh, it's it's not been a maintenance of the status quo. It's been a deterioration, um, and uh, I think that this gets to the fact that these institutions, which have been seized by corporate power, are not not only are they not reformable, but we don't have any mechanisms left within the establishment to reform them. Yes, and and I want to underscore your point also about sort of the. The lesser, the insidious, you know, evil of the lesser evil. Why did Congress flip? You know, why was a Democratic Congress lost? Because Obama was elected with enormous, you know, uh, mandate. But what did he do? The moment he got into office, he put his ground troops on the shelf, told them to go home. He he wasted what could have been a real grassroots engine for real change, and he bailed out Wall Street again. You know, and left millions of homeowners, you know, to be thrown out into the street. And he kept doing that over and over for two years. And he so, sabotaged the public option and shoved Obamacare, which a for-profit so, healthcare industry, which is not functional. I mean, you know more about it terrible. than I do. It's terrible. And that is why, and it's important for people to recognize, that's why Congress was lost. So the bottom line here is that the lesser evil makes the greater evil inevitable. It not only makes it possible, it makes it inevitable because it, it bitterly disappoints people and people whose hopes and expectations have been raised for justice and then they get basically uh, thrown under the bus. Either they're not going to come or they're going to punish you at the polls. And well, that's and we're happened. watching the rise of these white, proto fascist, nativist, neo Confederate, you know, celebrating the gun culture. Where did it come from? Well, it came from a disenfranchised white working class that heard the rhetoric of the liberals about multiculturalism and gender politics and mm -hmm. inclusivity. But mm -hmm. of course, the way that kind of faux liberalism defined it was we're going to have a woman CEO. We're not going to uh, liberate oppressed working or poor women. Mm -hmm. um, everything became about branding. We're going to have our first African-American president. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have these white, angry white groups uh, who realize that they have, of course, been uh, disenfranchised and pushed aside, and they hear the rhetoric, even though the rhetoric is a lie, because Obama has done nothing for most African-American people in this country. Um, I mean, mass incarceration is as bad or worse than when he came in, despite some cosmetic attempts to address it. And the wealth of the African-American community has been absolutely decimated. Exactly right. It used to be a ratio of 10 cents uh, family wealth of an African-American community to a dollar uh, in the white community. That 10 cents has been cut now to 5 cents. So this has been a disaster. And when people talk about, you know, needing to be terrorized by the next, you know, by the executive and therefore voting your worst fears rather than your values, two points. One is that democracy needs values. Democracy does not exist in a vacuum. And there's nothing more powerful than a moral compass. We have to bring that moral compass to our democracy because it is a ship lost in a storm right now. There is some risk in getting there, but you have to build. and. It, remember what happened under Richard Nixon, you know, one of the most oppressive, regressive, dishonest presidents out there. Uh, remember what we got because we had a movement in the streets. The power is ours. We got, you know, women's right to choose by pushing the uh, Supreme Court, which is also, an, you know, an institution that's amenable to public pressure. Um, we got you know, the, uh, we brought the troops home from Vietnam. We got the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and OSHA and established workers' rights and uh, well, Ralph and Nader calls him our last liberal president. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Because we, of movements. People have been systematically disempowered, you know, by our media. We're, we're fed this corporate brainwashing, you know, many times a day that we are powerless and therefore we have to choose uh, between two oppressors. And it's really important, you know, to reject that lesser evilism and stand up and fight for the greater good. The greater good here has been lost in the battle between well, we're, the evils. We're allowed, it's like voting on American Idol. I mean, we, that's what we're allowed to do. 
Um, it means nothing, as this study by the Princeton professor right. and his colleague have just pointed out. When you look actually at legislation, almost everything that's Good pushed through yes. uh, has very little popular support and serves the interests of corporate lobbyists who write it in the first place. Um, but it is a kind of species of participatory fascism. Um, it, it's a game and a very cruel one. And of course, we are bombarded with over the airwaves uh, exactly. with propaganda and all of which are driven to make all of the, uh, you know, to drive home the points that you made, that this is, uh, that we can't step outside the system. And yet our only hope, of course, is. And in fact, if we dare to have the courage of our convictions, you know, and those who are on this spectrum of justice among the many movements that there are, if we all stand up, you know, there's hardly anybody left sitting down. If we're standing up for workers' rights and for living wages and for health care as a human right and for ending student debt, for God's sake, 43 million young people who are locked in debt, if they alone come out to vote, we win this election because they have a plurality of the vote. If word gets out that young people can take over this election, if they stand up for themselves and for the leadership that they could have to really change direction, we can win this. So, you know, the, the, the weak link in this chain of change is to actually reject this mind-numbing disempowerment and acknowledge the power that we have. How's that going to come? Um, it, it, you know, it, it's obviously going to come through movements, and yes. we've seen the rise of some magnificent movements, Black Lives Matter, the anti-fracking movement. Um, very courageous. I spoke to anti-fracking activists in Denver. What was so moving is they're all suffering from, many of them, from respiratory mm -hmm. problems and from rashes because they're going into the fracking fields to mm -hmm. fight back. So they're actually taking on the kinds of health effects that people who live around fracking, the poison. That's, and the workers. And the workers particular. and the workers yeah. who are there. Yeah, um, And, you know, it, we're almost starting from scratch in many ways because our movements have been decimated. The American workforce is no, is no longer unionized, less than 12%. Most of them are public sector workers, I think 6%, so they can't even strike. So we're in, we're in the midst of a presidential election, uh, which is a political, a, a species of political theater, highly funded, what $2 billion we're going to spend. Um, and yet it, it has effectively captured, even you know the purported left. Uh, and how do we break through? How do we uh, make this reality one that can be visible within a broader spectrum of the public? First, um, to quote Woody Allen, half of life is showing up. You know, I think it's really important that we be putting forward a different narrative, you know, and a moral compass. That's why I run, you know, that's why I'm running in this election and in the last one. Um, do I think we're going to win? I'm not holding my breath, but I'm not ruling it out. And a lot depends on how you define the win. We are in the age of the black swan. You know, all these like world changing, absolutely unlikely events are now becoming commonplace. Um, and, you know, like the breakup of the, of the uh, major ice sheets that could raise our sea right. level by 10 or 20 or 30 feet in the next couple of decades and utterly destroy civilization, you know. I mean, we've got big things that are happening right now that are um, rather unpredictable about when they're going to happen, et cetera. We could have a big disaster between now and, and the election, and who knows what that would be. And that could completely change the terms of the election. But let me just tell you one other way that the terms of the election could change, you know, and that is if young people decide, if, if word gets out, oh, my God. God, you know, and young people self-organize, which they can do. We could also turn this election on its head. But, you know, more broadly to your point, um, I used to feel like we had to change people's minds, and I've now become quite convinced we don't have to change people's minds because history, you know, does that, and the economy and the environment and the climate have already done that. So the question becomes, how do we organize the momentum that's already there? And strategically, that's that's a very difficult question, but it is, you know, in a way that, that's a tactical question. I think it's so empowering to recognize that in the court of public opinion, we have won. Um, polls now show, in fact, 21 percent of Americans identify as Republicans. This is a Wall Street Journal poll done in June of, last, of this recent year. So 21 percent identify as Republican, 29 percent identify as Democrat. This is like all-time low, and 50 percent have rejected them both. 
uh, the two major parties actually have incurred majority unfavorable ratings by most of the public. People don't trust the two parties, and they shouldn't. Um, and you know, it's a communications challenge. And we have tools of communications. We have tools to do, um, uh, you know, to do basically guerrilla, uh, guerrilla media and guerrilla marketing. And you have self-organizing constituencies on, on Facebook and, and so and, on. And yet, the great impediment is the military-industrial complex, oh, which absolutely. has seized control of the economy, seized control of the federal budget, carries out wholesale surveillance. It will fight tooth and nail. And it will. And, and I don't think we know exactly where it's going to go, but you know, we would be crazy to stop because we are, you know, we have one and a half feet over the cliff right now. You know, so it's like, are, are we just going to roll over here and get pushed off the cliff? Or are we going to stand up and fight? So, you know, it's not like you need an assured endpoint. But we know at the end point, we know the trajectory that we're on. So the question is, how do we optimize what history is going to do here? Because history will mobilize people as the treachery of the system continues to be inflicted on us. And the question is whether we will mobilize in time to change it. And to you, the point you were making early on is that as one candidate, you cannot do this. Right. If a good candidate can squeak through the Democratic Party process, well, that's great, but that does not change make. We need a movement. That movement needs a political party, which is only one mode of how that movement works. And we have to work on all cylinders. Uh, in an election, you want to maximize everything you can do through the electoral process. And that includes building a party so that the movement doesn't die with your campaign at the end of the and election cycle. That's what cycle. we're going to talk about in the second segment. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Thank you. And thank you for watching Days of Revolt. Had to eat out the watermelon patch. And you know they put me in a shack. 